very much all for coming to the meetup tonight. Tonight we will have two speakers. The first speaker will be Rob Wood, and he will be learning us more about hardware hacking and will be giving us about hardware hacking. Rob Wood is working at MCC and he has more than 20 years of experience in various parts of embedded programming and security. So that's all I have to say. Uh, yeah, uh, feel free to shove questions whenever you have them because I'm a terrible speaker, so slow me down, it'll work better. That's speak really fast. Um, so yeah, as we mentioned, uh, I'm at NCC Group now, I've been a consultant for about a year and a half now. Uh, formerly, I was at Motorola. We had a small office in town doing mobile phones until Google sold us to Lenovo and they closed the office. <laughs> prior, prior to that, I was 12 years at BlackBerry, uh, nine years in embedded development, and three years doing uh, hardware security. Um, but, uh, you know, being there a long time, built everything from the ground up and done kind of cool everything. Um, I wasn't going to publish these slides just because I stole all the images. Um, so, I don't know if I got recording. Who cares? Um, as I said, shout out questions if you have them. Um, I'm going to gloss over a lot of things, and if you want more, you can just ask. Uh, this is a brief outline. Uh, we'll kind of go over what hardware is, how it works. Um, where the hardware bugs typically are, or, or commonly are. Uh, I'm going to go through a bunch of examples and stories, things that I've seen uh, in the past. <clears throat> so what is hardware hacking? Um, generally, it's about privilege escalation. Uh, if you guys are familiar with software hacking, it's the same thing. We're just trying to undermine a lot of the assumptions that the software developer may have made. Uh, for example, if you assume that this instruction always happens after that one, because that's how the software is written, maybe we can violate that assumption by fiddling with the hardware. Um, so we can talk funny things to happen. Um, you know, we follow everyone else's case instead of, instead of the if, uh, where the developer didn't expect that, and then we can, we can get advantage of that. Uh, generally, it's about data extraction. So you, you want to get the secrets, uh, you know, the person's email, you want to get their contact information, their Wi-Fi credentials, whatever the data happens to be. Uh, generally, hardware hacking, as opposed to software hacking, is a little bit harder to get into. There is some equipment costs. It doesn't have to be very expensive. You can spend millions of dollars, you can spend tens of dollars, depending on what level you want to get at and what, what the target of your, of your endeavors is. Um, and generally, hardware security is very poor. Uh, I would say about 15 years behind the state of the art uh, in software security, and it's only getting better very slowly. Uh, so, I mean, the world is wide open. Any Internet of Things, I don't know if you guys are on Twitter, there's an Internet of Shit account. <laughs> he posts nonstop hilarity. Everything is broken and terrible. Uh, so, Hardware security really got off the ground in the 80s and 90s. There was a pay TV market, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with satellite TV, and they had these little smart cards, and all of the rival companies were hacking each other's stuff um, and publishing all the exploits, just trying to get a leg up. Um, it's not terribly legal these days, but back then, anything goes. Uh, and as a result, smart cards are like top notch security, so the actual chip inside your credit card is pretty good. Um, and then below that, hardware security modules, so these are the kinds of things that uh, large companies will use to do all of their SSL signing or code signing or anything like that. These are sort of the circuit board equivalent of that single chip solution that's in your smart card. And it's not quite as good, but they're pretty good. And below that smartphones, I would say, thanks to BlackBerry and the great work of the locals here, um, we, we really had top-notch hardware security right from the early 2000s. Um, uh, and only recently you're starting to see like Android vendors and Apple catching up and surpassing what BlackBerry once was. Uh, so that's, that's neat. And then everything else is far below that. Um, automotive has just recently woken up, and they have, they've actually standardized on, on systems that are terribly insecure. The CAN bus in your car connects all of these computers in your car, and there's zero security on it. Uh, so once you have access to that, you can shut off the left side brakes, just the left side, or you know, change the steering, or whatever. So, <laughs> and, and, and all of this has just recently come to the attention of, of the automotive company, and security is really a subset of safety. So they're really taking it seriously, and they're trying to grow up really, really fast. So it's really neat to see. Um, but as a consultant, it's made lots of money, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that is how we work. Um, you know, at its most basic, you have transistors, uh, which are just essentially switches for electrical signals. Uh, you piece them together, and you get logic gates. Uh, logic gates, you know, you can build certain kinds of logic. Uh, one particular arrangement with some feedback gives you a flip-flop. That's this. 
this guy over here, you get a flip-flop, and that allows you to build things that are synchronous on clocks. So every time a clock cycle happens, you can have some logic out there. So that's, that's what this here is showing. So some, some kind of logic di di dictates what state happens next. And so you can kind of traverse these state diagrams and come up with all kinds of complicated things, such as like a whole CPU. Um, and then once you have components, you piece them all together on a circuit board, and that's the picture below here. Um, so you build, you know, you name it, any sort of electronic device. And generally, if it's even more complicated than that, then you have it run by some sort of software. You'll have some kind of CPU and, and whatnot. And that's where you get some interesting data, you know, the, the secrets that we're interested in having. So that was secure hardware design. Um, layers of trust is sort of the, the general mantra. Um, so you have all your secrets at the top. You, know, you might have some data in the cloud. You might have uh, some factory secrets, some intellectual property. You know, you got your, all your user data, of course, which you're all familiar with. Uh, and that could be protected by things like your file system and your operating system. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole diagram here, but I mean, the whole system is layers, and so you're going to have some like debug ports, and those will be protected with passwords or or secret keys or something like that, all the way down to the hardware. Um, and at some point, you have to trust the vendor of the hardware to have built it correctly. Um, but what if the vendor of the hardware doesn't trust their vendor? So they pick some CPUs from some vendor, and they might have backdoored the CPUs. So you, you can kind of build these layers of trust all the way down. At some point, you have to trust someone. Um, and what generally people who are conscious about hardware security will do is they will never trust a single supplier. So you, you need two, two of your suppliers in collusion to defeat the security of the device. And that's sort of the state of the art. Now, how is actual hardware design? Nobody does almost any of this. Um, <laughs> you, you end up with, you know, your application runs on the operating system and it just assumes the operating system is secure and that's it. So if you find some kernel exploit, you're, you're wide open. Um, Android is notoriously bad for this. Almost all systems on Android rely on a kernel for some sort of security. And if you get a kernel exploit, the whole system is wide open. Uh, there is there is some vendors who are pushing the boundary a little bit, but not by much. Um, and yeah, it's anything that I see. I come from a smartphone background, and so I talk about that a lot. But if it's another embedded device, like uh, like your home router, or um, I don't know if you see those smart locks, you know, Bluetooth things you can open a your door, anything like that. Everything I've seen so far is, is total garbage. Open it up with a screwdriver, then you got everything. Uh, generally, they rely on the security of your locked front door. It's, it's behind your, your front door, and as long as your house is locked, then it's fine. No one's going to break into your house and, and jailbreak your router if it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I just read my AAA thing today and said that 75% of Bluetooth smart locks are easily hacked. Yeah, yeah, actually, last week at DEF CON, uh, some people did a uh, presentation and they reviewed a bunch of the, the cheaper brands of them. There, there are some good ones, um, but not many. Generally, Usually that's true of all of your uh, non-smart blocks also. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and the better smart blocks you'll find are from reputable lock companies. People who understand like physical security will build better smart blocks as well. Um, the ones that are from these little startup companies who are just like, hey, let's get into smart blocks. Don't typically do a good job. Um, so finding the bugs, step one, read the specs. Like 90% of the bugs will be documented. You know, the, the device works like this, like this, like this, and you start piecing together and go, wait a minute, but what if I do this? Then all of a sudden, you know, it, but it's all in the documentation. If you can find the specs, uh, a lot of components will have their specs posted online. It's just, you know, it's part of their sales uh, posture. You know, they want people to be able to read up on their devices to select them for their, for their uh, designs. Um, the FCC and patent disclosure websites are really useful. Sometimes if it's a proprietary component, they won't have the specs on their website, but there will be tons of information on the FCC website. That's all public information uh, and patents as well. Uh, and Chinese websites, they're not supposed to publish all this stuff, but the Shenzhen market has absolutely everything. There's, there's literally no electronic device that's not at least 90% built in China, and the Chinese have very little uh, IP protection laws. Uh, China, Indonesia, Brazil, Russia, Another one, India. But those six countries are really terrible for IP protection, and as a result, uh, you can pretty much find anything that goes through those countries. So, so that's useful. Um, the errata for, for the, the hardware components. Uh, so when you put out a design, you will, you know, six months later, you'll have some customers complaining. So you'll document those bugs they found, um, and you'll publish errata. Those are really useful. A really good example is uh, there was a particular ARM core where if you executed certain instructions in a particular order, it wasn't an order that most compilers would ever generate, but if you can't craft to that, then it would just jump into supervisor mode. Um, so I mean, they fixed that one pretty early, and I don't, I'm not aware of any products that actually ship with it, but uh, if you find something like that in Eurata, then you have a really good one. 
Uh, fuzzing the hardware interfaces, so once you connect to the device, you know, the serial ports or, or whatever, you can start uh, sending in malformed data, uh, finding bugs that way. And this is really the same thing that people do on the software side, so you, you have some file format you want to fuzz. This is no different, you're just doing it at the, uh, at the signaling level of the protocol. Uh, glitching and fault injection is a fun one. So uh, back to the earlier diagram I showed the state machine. Um, that everything happens on a clock, and there's some combinatorial logic that determines what the next state is going to be. There's going to be some tiny propagation delay for the signals to get through that combinatorial logic. If you mess with the clock, or the power, or other signals on the system, you can actually have that logic behave incorrectly, and you can actually jump states sooner than the result of that calculation, so you can actually get to the wrong state. Um, and so, so you might enable something that shouldn't be enabled, like a debug mode, or, or you know, it really depends on the system. Uh, and then you get to like the really expensive stuff, invasive uh, modifications. So things like uh, focus ion beam or scanning electron microscope, um, laser induced fault ejection, where you actually decap the silica and modify the silica directly to get at the, the secrets or, or cause the circuit to misbehave. Um, so what are the secrets? And again, this isn't this isn't new stuff. So you know your user data, so your email, biometrics is really interesting. Um, account credentials, if you're, you know, you've got a, a smart light bulb on your porch and it has your Wi-Fi credentials, all I have to do is walk up to your house, unscrew that, and now I've got your Wi-Fi credentials, I can get access to your network without ever breaking your door down. That's kind of what people don't typically think of. Uh, the software is useful. Uh, reverse engineering the software is often the next step to figure out you know, how you're going to, to break into the system. Uh, intellectual property counterfeiting, industrial espionage, these are really big problems, especially if you have a really successful product. Uh, we saw a lot of this in the smartphone space, and we spent considerable effort making sure that our factories were building products that were secure, uh, and yet people who were building products that weren't in our factory wouldn't work with our network. So for example, if I was to take this device off the shelf and reverse engineer it, I could build a counterfeit, and you can't stop me. But if this device talks to your network, you can prevent this counterfeit device from talking to your network, because it wouldn't have all of the, the right secrets or whatever you put in your, fa in, in your factory provisioning in there. Um, so that, that's kind of a neat one. Uh, network access. Uh, there was a, a talk a couple of years ago where people uh, managed to hack some HP printers and they were able to infect them with malware. But when your IT guys come around, they're doing the virus scanning and they're making sure all your software is up to date, they never look at the printers. They don't look at the IP phones on your desk and they're all connected to the same networks. And if I get access to one of those devices, I can use that to move laterally within your network, in your organization, um, or gain persistence in your network. So if you uh, you, know, you think you've eradicated the infection, but I'm still sitting there on your printer. <laughs> uh, surveillance is, is something that's very topical. Um, your cell phone contains 15 or 50 sensors of all sorts, uh, and you're carrying this around willingly, so now I can track you. Um, you know, your car has uh, you know, your 407 transponder. I can, I can track that. I can uh, do a tire pressure sensor. It's a wireless device on your car. I can track that. They all have unique identifiers on them, so I know that's your car follow you around the city. And the police do this already in, in many cities, just, just to track people. <clears throat> so where are the secrets? Um, generally, you need some sort of memory. So there's really two kinds of memory on the device. You have persistent memory, which is kind of your flash memory, uh, your EPROMs. You don't see EPROMs very much anymore. Uh, and your ROM. Um, Fuses is something that's neat. That's more of a, a kind of a programmable ROM. Um, and sometimes you'll see removable memory, so like your removable SD cards and whatnot. And then you have your volatile memory, um, so SRAMs and DRAMs. SRAMs are very fast, they'll, they'll be used inside a processor, but they're also very expensive because they take up a lot of real estate on the chip. Uh, so DRAM is slower, but you know, higher density. So you know, SRAM will be like kilobytes, and DRAM will be like gigabytes these days. Um, and then of course, the cloud. So if you have like uh, a connected device of any kind, it's going to have some credentials to some cloud storage, usually uh, some kind of your Amazon account or your Google account, whatever. Uh, if I can get access to those credentials by hacking your device, now I've got access to your cloud, uh, or your, or your, your data computers are, or whatever. Uh, so flash memory, uh, let's talk a little bit of this, because it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. There's a bunch of different kinds. Uh, you'll see serial memories quite a lot, and these are often in like, a little ink in package, and you connect to them by putting on a little chip clip um, in the Fisher NetRater. Um, nor memories you don't see very much of anymore. Um, they're very low density, slow memories. MAND is very high density, so you'll see you'll see those a lot more frequently on, on higher end devices like, like cell phones that have lots of memory. Um, but you still see NOR on a lot of embedded controllers for uh, like, uh, 
ancestral controls and whatnot. And then you have managed man. So the thing with, with NOR is you can read and write individual bytes. Uh, with NAND, you can do it on pages, but pages can go bad. And if they go bad, you need to deal with that in software, which is very expensive, it's complicated. Every vendor has different properties, so you have to deal with that. Uh, with managed NAND, they hide all of that behind a controller. So there's a little microcontroller, which again runs firmware and can be hacked. Uh, and people have done this. Um, inside the chip itself, and it deals with all the, the wear leveling and the bad block management and all that stuff. So that's really, really nice. Um, so and there's a few different examples of that. EMMC is very, it's, it's a variant of SD cards, and so you'll see, you'll see those quite a lot. Um, UFS is sort of a newer one. I haven't actually seen this one in a while, but I've read about it. Um, and so then you have, on top of your flash memory, you have file systems. So you need some, some way to arrange all your data in, in, the, in the flash memory. And there's you know, dozens and dozens of different kinds of file systems. Everyone, I mean, YAFS is, uh, it stands for yet another flash file system because there are so many. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of very common ones you'll see, and I've listed some of them here. Uh, and then there's like too many proprietary ones to name. Everyone kind of, back in the day when it was new, the flash memories were new, it was, everyone had to create their own, there wasn't any standards. <coughs> Um, so how is flash memory vulnerable? I mean, you can always, at, fundamentally, just pull the memory chip off and put it on a flash reader uh, and just dump the memory, um, unless it's encrypted, of course. Uh, so that's that's fairly common. There's very few devices I've seen in the wild that are actually doing memory encryption. Um, some of the higher end devices on that pyramid I showed earlier will be doing this, but not many. Um, direct write access. So if, if you were able to pull the memory chip off, you could write to the memory chip and put it back on. So now you've modified the file system without going through any of the software rules that would otherwise prevent you. You, know, you, don't, have, you don't necessarily know the password to write to the file system, you can just pull it off and write directly to it. Um, and so by doing things like code signing and data signing, uh, write protecting the memory and things like that, you can, you can sort of mitigate those. Um, and time of check, time of use is sort of a general class of problem. So what, one of the things that that uh, designers will do is they'll verify all the contents of memory, they'll validate all the signatures of the of their code, and then they'll start running it. So they read it once to verify it, and then they read it again to run it. If in between those two operations you're able to modify it, then then you know you can defeat the security quite easily. Um, and, th and this is quite easy to do, like, especially with something like MMC where it has a very low pin count. You can connect to um, plug in an SD card, for example, and you have the MMC plug into an FPGA, which is connected to the chip. Then, like the FPGA, after it does the, the the checks on a very like cycle accurate basis, you can switch from one memory to the other, and all of a sudden you're reading a duplicate file system, which is exactly the same, except it has you know, your malware in there or something. Um, that's, that's kind of a common thing. The, the easiest way to mitigate this is to kind of copy everything into RAM, verify it there, and then use it there. Uh, but that means you need enough RAM to do that, so it can be it can be expensive cost wise. Um, and then memory swap. I mean, if, even if you've right protected the memory and you've done all these right things, I can just pull the memory off, take the contents, stick it in a brand new memory I got from the vendor, and then put that on. Uh, so one of the things you do there is most memory chips will have sort of a unique ID, or uh, EMFC has this uh, replay protected memory block, which allows you to provision the memory with some secrets, and that you, know, you can cryptographically bind uh, the circuit board or the processor or something to the memory to protect it. Uh, and then of course, you know, file system parsing issues. I mean, file systems are complex data objects, and you know they have all sorts of metadata in there that you can mess with. Um, uh, so just kind of highlight the layout of NOR and NAND, so you can kind of see the difference. Uh, so NOR, NOR chips will be smaller generally, and they're arranged in banks. So if I'm writing or erasing from a particular bank of memory, that whole bank, so that whole four megabyte chunk, will be off limits. It won't actually. If I try and read it, I won't get any data back, I'll just get status codes. So you have to arrange your software in such a way that you can avoid uh, simultaneous access, uh, which, which can be cumbersome, but uh, if you design it properly, it works reasonably well. Uh, so generally, you would erase an entire block at a time, but you can write a single byte at a time. With NAND, it's a little different. You can write an entire page at a time, which is generally like uh, 512 bytes or 4K more typically. Um, but you can erase a block, so 128K. Um, and, and to get the high densities, they'll often stack multiple multiple chips in the same package. You don't really see that from the outside, but it's all encapsulated. So you, you have you know multiple gigabyte dies, for example, stacked together. And each, each of those dies will consist of a, a bunch of 120K blocks. Those blocks are, are the smallest unit that can go bad, so you need to keep track of that. And in order to keep track of that, each block 
or sorry, each page will have a, a number of spare bytes, and those are generally not visible. So it's a nice place to hide um, malware, for example, or you can use hide um, like status flags to say this block is bad or or whatnot. Um, but generally, they're used by the memory controller to put error correction bits. So if if bits in that page go bad, the error correction bits will allow you to correct for it. So you can kind of get early warnings. So you know I can detect two bits have gone bad and correct one bit. So you can slowly start to see it go bad and then you say, hey, this is gonna go bad soon, maybe I should stop using that block. And so this is sort of the complexity that, you know, as a file system designer, you have to deal with, uh, which anytime you have a complex system, you, know, you get more software bugs. Uh, so step one, if you're gonna try and like hack any kind of hardware is, I don't know if you guys have done any electrical engineering, but all electronics are powered by magic smoke. And if you let the magic smoke out, they stop working. So, so it gives just some tips to try and keep all the magic going in. Um, make sure you get the right voltage. Uh, a lot of devices will be 5 volts or 3.3 3 volts. Um, some of the newer uh, high speed components are like down to 1.2. I've seen some even at 0.7. Right? Which, so I got a, the transistors generally switch around 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts. So getting down to those low voltages means you really, really are trying to push the limits of speed. Um, you're probably not going to see this in any devices you're beginning on. Um, you can buy like an Arduino or something that you kind of um, anything automotive will be 12 volts usually in, uh, in North America, it's 24 in Europe. Um, and some devices will actually have multiple power domains. So the, the pad ring that, that drives all the external circuitry of the chip will be on one power rail, but the core logic inside will be a different one. Um, and they can be the same voltage, sometimes they're different uh, depending on the device. So you just need to make sure that get it all lined up. If you're trying to connect your laptop, which you know, USB is 5 volts, if you're trying to connect that to a device that's running at 1.2, you can try something. Uh, clock speed is a useful thing to, to know. If you're going to go buy some, some equipment, a uh, logic analyzer or whatever, make sure that it supports the clock speeds of the device you're trying to, to analyze, or you, you might find yourself spending a lot of money on something useless. Um, yeah. How do you know that? Which ones? How do you know the clock speed? Yeah. Um, well, if you have the component specs, for example, it'll all be listed there. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the easiest way. Okay. Uh, I mean, you could measure it. If you, if you have access to a, a nice oscilloscope, for example, you can measure the, oh, yeah. the frequency yes. uh, and then go buy your own equipment accordingly. Oh, yeah. uh, generally, logic analyzers will have a lower clock speed than an oscilloscope. You can get a pretty cheap oscilloscope that'll measure frequency and then buy a you know, more expensive logic analyzer. Um, push, pull, and open drain. So if you're trying, uh, if, if one, if the device you're trying to attack is driving the bus and you're trying to also drive it, um, you end up with a, a bus contention and, and you can end up with a, a, essentially a short circuit that will dissipate a lot of power and you can burn something out. So you need to make sure you understand you know, what you're connecting to. The easiest thing to do to start out is to just connect passively to everything and just kind of listen to what it's doing first um, rather than just trying to, to talk to it. Uh, grounding issues is very common as well. If you're connecting your laptop to, say, a serial port, and then you've got something else in your laptop connected to it, you could actually end up with like a, a loop of current along the, the grounding signals if you don't have everything connected correctly. And I think that's commonly frying things. Um, and similar to that is back powering. You could actually um, have power not through the power rails on the device, but through some other signal which isn't designed for that kind of current load. And you can actually power up a device through like an LED, for example, um, if, you're, if you have things connected. So you need to be careful with that. ASD, I still think it's a myth, but it's always pretty good. Anyways, I've never seen anything like this shot, but it's pretty, it's pretty easy to, to mitigate. You just make sure that you know, you're working on a conductor or a, a static sensitive surface so that you're not building up any charge. Uh, the one time I did see something interesting, um, we had, uh, this is years ago at Blackberry, um, we found devices were resetting suddenly all the time. It was just before launch, it's always just before launch. Um, and we spent like, like sleepless nights trying to debug this issue. Why these devices just resetting all the time? And it turns out it would only happen, uh, it only started happening in the winter, because it was cold, there's less moisture in the air, ESD is a bigger issue, and only to people wearing nylon pants. If they slide the phone into the pocket, the nylon would build a charge, and it would like zap something, and then there's would reset. And it, anyway, we figured out, anyway, that's the only ESD issue I've ever seen. Don't wear nylon pants. <laughs> yeah. That's the solution. Put in the release notes. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so like, like I said earlier, I mean, the cost of the tools can range quite widely. Um, get yourself a multimeter. You can get a cheap one entire for like 10 bucks. I, I recommend a fluke one of really these nice yellow ones there. I mean, we try to use on brand specific NTC, but I mean, fluke is really top notch, really good. But they are more expensive than uh, 
uh, they make tons of features and they're really useful. Uh, but this is useful for measuring things like voltages and whatnot. So you can actually uh, figure out what, uh, what voltages you need to get to. You can actually use this to um, feed our report. So you, um, you open up a device and you start poking around, you can actually see which, which pins are connected to which other pins, for example, so you can start reverse engineering the, the signal routing on the circuit board, which is going to be really useful to follow um, signals if you're trying to find a serial port or something like that. Oscilloscopes are invaluable, uh, and you can get a really decent one for like 500 bucks, um, and they range up to like obscene amounts of money, um, depending on the speed and the feature set that they have. Um, the, the one picture there is actually really nice. It's a uh, the brand name, but you can upgrade it. So almost all these oscilloscopes will ship with like extra memory, and extra features, and then you have to pay the money and give you a code you can enter to upgrade it. Because it's cheaper for them to ship you with extra memory to start with, to ship it later when you order it. And as a result, this one here, you can just connect to it, dump the memory, grab the codes out of the memory, and enter those codes, and now you've got a $3,000 code that you pay 500 bucks for. Um, so I've got two of these in my lab here, right now. So. <laughs> Uh, the logic analyzer, uh, so the difference between an oscilloscope and a logic analyzer is an oscilloscope will do analog signals, which is really useful if you're finding like signal integrity issues or you're trying to measure things like clock speed and whatnot. Whereas, and, but generally you're going to find it hard to get an oscilloscope with more than like four channels. A logic analyzer, it's not uncommon to see some with like 200 or 500 channels, but they'll generally only do digital signals. Um, but they'll have like analyzers for different protocols, so you can like hook up to an entire memory bus and you can figure out what the contents of memory are based on that, or you know, you can, um, I don't know, any kind of protocol really, but they're just, it's digital only, so, but they're a lot more expensive usually. What does uh, channels mean in that context? Uh, like signal wire. Oh, so they have 200 wires coming out? Yeah, so actually it'll have, it'll usually have like a big fat cable going to like a little pod, and off that pod will be like a spider, like a bunch of little wires. You can just attach it to like yeah. a bunch of different pins and watch all of them. Yeah, or, or if your device has been designed for it, it'll have like a high speed connector that you just kind of snap it onto, and it has like 100 signals all in that one connector. Um, cool. So if you're doing like memory testing or something, you'll build your board with one of these connectors on there already. <coughs> so that's actually a comment I don't think I put in the presentation, but if you're analyzing a board and you see these funny connectors which aren't connected to anything, or if they're not populated, you might see the pads on the circuit board where a connector should go, but there's no connector. It's a good indicator there's some sort of debug feature there. That Take a look at it. <laughs> it happens all the time. Uh, so, sometimes these are used in the factory for provisioning or testing. Uh, sometimes they're there for developers uh, and they don't probably take them off on the final board spin. Uh, so, so they're, they're, they're useful for hackers. I mean, it's like a backdoor in your software, right? Uh, FTDI cables. This is just, I mean, this is a company that makes these. There's a bunch of companies that make similar ones. Um, essentially, it's a USB to serial converter. A lot of devices still operate on serial, uh, but your laptops don't have serial ports anymore. So. These guys kind of fill that gap. Uh, you can get these cables for like five dollars or fifty dollars, depending on. They're all they're all really the same thing. It's just a little chip that converts USB to serial. It allows you to connect your laptop, which is really handy. Uh, and JTAG cables, similar. Um, so JTAG is I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but it's basically a hardware debug uh, facility that most devices will have. Um, and for God knows what reason, these cables range up to like fifteen thousand dollars, but you can build them yourself for like five dollars worth of boards. The discrepancy is, is always a discrepancy in monster cables. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool <play> <laughs> uh, so generally, the more expensive ones will come from like reputable companies. They'll support more devices, um, higher clock speeds, things like that. Um, so if you're dealing with like a, say a Qualcomm processor, Qualcomm will actually pay uh, this company, Modernbach in Germany, to make their JTAG adapters work with their chips even before their chips hit the market. So when they go to like an OEM, like Blackberry or Motorola or whoever, and say, you want to build a device, buy these JTAG cables and it will work because we, you know, we have the support. Uh, and those ones are like the $50,000 ones. Uh, so they work everywhere, which is great. Um, but if you just need something to poke at your own router, you know, 15 bucks is fine. And then there's, of course, a lot of open source tools that people have built. Uh, and a lot of these come out of the security community. So a JTAGulator is uh, a device that will let you figure out where the JTAG lines are. So you connect you know, 20 different wires to a bunch of test points on your board, and you don't know anything about them, and it'll brute force and figure out which ones are the JTAG. It's really handy. Uh, Bus Pirate is um, kind of like an FTDI cable, but has a lot of other features as well. Face Answer is kind of the one you plug that into a USB port, and it'll emulate other USB devices. You plug it into someone's laptop, and it'll enumerate as a as a keyboard or a mouse or a camera or whatever. Um, just pretend to be whatever it wants so you can play with things. Uh, and there's protocol analyzers for like literally every protocol. Um, so if you want to do like any serious USB 
uh, fuzzing or anything like that, you probably don't want to go buy like a purpose-made analyzer for that. Um, or just, you know, if, if your employer is designing your device, you may actually have access to one of these for example, designers that are really heavy. Uh, and FPGA boards, and that's what this picture at the bottom here is. I didn't really have any pictures there. Uh, anyway, so that one, that's your multimeter. Okay, so let's go logic analyzer. This is your FPGA cable. As you can see, it's a USB port on one end, and the other end is just like eight or ten wires. So you can hook that up to, it does a bunch of different functions. Serial ports is one of them. Um, and this is like a really, really cheap FPGA board. So it has an FTDI built in and a, and a FPGA, and that's it. And so you can, it's $20. It's like the cheapest FPGA I've found, and it's super, super flexible and awesome, and I can't recommend it enough. Um, but you can get FPGA boards with all sorts of different features, range, like crazy prices. They use uh, FPGAs for like $100,000 per chip uh, for like really high end routers, and so you can get you know, all sorts of feature sets in there. Uh, but this one here, for most of what I do, I use this one, it's 20 bucks, it's super awesome. Um, and I really describe it as like kind of the hardware equivalent of Python. If you ever have to just, you know, develop some piece of hardware to, to glue something to something else, um, yeah, FPGA is really a quick way to do it. Similar to how you use Python to script up some some software attack or whatever. And then FPGA board, you have to solder some headers onto those so this one, of the I.O. Yeah, so there's, so there's a couple of unpopulated script headers here. You can see the pop into a breadboard. So then there's, there's also eight IOs in a little connector here. So I'll keep it directly. Um, so if you just make something like a little bit of you can just use it as is. Just kind of handy. So if you, for example, want to use it as an FTDI just to get access to the serial port, you can figure the FTDI just kind of straight through from that which way. That's a little logic for you. And then of course you have all your software tools, so you can binary editors, your decompilers, um, firmware mod kits have kind of a neat suite of tools for modifying, um, mostly for phone firmwares, but it does a lot of routers and other things as well. Um, and like dozens more. Um, but, I don't know what happened there, but we're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you're gonna do any wireless stuff, um, a software-defined radio is really useful. This one at the top here is the size of a credit card. Uh, it's like $500, and with that, you can stand up your own cell phone, cell phone tower, um, and you can connect to it with your phone, you can send an SMS, you can do all sorts of neat things. Um, and so that will that'll support, actually, this one will support 2G, but it won't do 3G or 4G. They have a, a larger one, it's called that big, uh, same price, uh, which will do 3G and 4G. The main difference is got more channels, um, so you can do some fun testing there. Uh, if you do any Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, uh, ZigBee, any of these other um, smaller protocols, you can buy cheap dongles. TI makes a lot of really um, neat components for doing these wireless solutions, and they also make dev boards. They sell, I think all of them are less than 50 bucks, um, but they're, they're really handy. They come with lots of good software tools directly from, from TI, so we use a lot of those when we're, when we're testing client stuff. If you're doing any kind of radio stuff, you're going to want to put it in a Faraday cage, especially if you're doing anything that requires certification. Uh, so Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are sort of consumer band radio, and you're kind of allowed to play with those as long as you're not overpowering everyone else. Um, with cellular radios, you're, you're not legally allowed to operate without a license. Um, so a Faraday cage is, is useful for that. Um, and you can, you know, this, these boxes here are like $2,000. Um, at RIG, we had uh, whole rooms which were lined with, with metal, uh, and people would just do all the testing in those rooms. Um, but, you know, if you're cheap, just round it to foil. That works too. Um, <laughs> that corners. Uh, GNU Radio is a really useful software package for, for doing radio testing. Uh, you can implement all sorts of radio protocols there, and there's loads and loads of stuff online for that. Uh, OpenBTS and OpenLT, uh, these are um, the cell phone tower packages I mentioned. Um, uh, side channel stuff is kind of fun, so if you're doing uh, like simple power analysis, uh, differential power analysis, basically what you do is you put an antenna on top of a chip, and you, every time a transistor switches, there's a magnetic field change. And you can pick up those every time the transistor switches, and you can kind of infer, um, you know, essentially what the crypto keys are based on those signals. Um, it's a little more complex than that. There's a lot of math behind it. Um, but, you know, with a decent oscilloscope and a sensitive probe, you, you, can, you can sniff the keys right out of the air. And, and this is true even for, for modern devices. So if you're doing all your operations inside the chip, you know, in cache memory where there's, there's very little, um, Power emanation, you can still do this. Uh, it just becomes a little more, you just need more expensive equipment, essentially. Um, but there was a university of Waterloo researcher who we worked with years ago, did a lot of this from three feet away, 
she was able to tell whether your phone was doing AES or RSA, um, which is bad impressive, I guess, if you look at the technology, but I don't know, 40 feet away is quite far, so it's kind of neat. Um, and then, of course, you know, failure analysis. If you're doing, if you're doing any sort of invasive chip uh, hacking, you're going to want to invest heavily or find someone who has and just borrow their lab. Uh, so you're going to decap your chips, use a focused ion beam. Um, this picture here, you can see the, this is a, the surface of a chip. And so there's a signal that runs across here. So the, surface, the chip is, is layers of metal, essentially. So you have um, your active silicon, where they, you know, they dump the silicon, and that's where all your transistors are. And then there's layers and layers of metal interconnects that connect everything together. And you have know, eight or 10 layers. Um, so this is sort of the top layer. And what they've done is they use the focus ion beam to mill out a section of, of, of uh, metal here to disconnect this. And then they bridge this signal over to whatever the this is. Um, and so you know, they modify the circuit like right on the silicon, um, which is kind of the level of stuff you can do uh, with, a, with a focus ion beam. So if you have one, let me know. <laughs> and the cabinet x-ray machines in this other picture here is an x-ray uh, of the section of a board. Um, most circuit boards these days are going to be at least four layers. Uh, you know, your iPhone probably has 12 or 16. Um, and if you're trying to follow a trace through there, it's going to be very hard. If you are allowed to do destructive testing, if your client has sent to you like many boards, you just tear one apart, just send it down layer by layer, put it on your flatbed scanner, and just like reverse engineer it that way. If they've only sent you one and you need to do it non-destructively, an X-ray machine is awesome. We have one of these and we use them all the time. Um, so you can kind of follow a trace. You know, you have the component specs for the processor. You know that these pins are the serial port or the JTAG or whatever, and you want to follow them through the board, find out where they're going to come up. Um, so you just need to see it instead of the parts. So how do you connect to it? Um, look for connectors. Like I mentioned earlier, um, if there's unpopulated headers uh, on the board, those are really good indicators. Uh, test points are super handy. This, this is a, I think a phone of some kind, and it, you've got these like array of test points here. Um, often you'll see like little tiny dimples in them, and that's a, an indicator that uh, maybe they were using in manufacturing, not like a bed of nails that comes down and makes contact with them for programming or testing or something. Uh, so those, those are generally active uh, products. Uh, if, if you see a board without any test points, it's usually a good indicator that they've actually put some thought into the hardware security. Um, so flywires are a good one. So you can flywire directly to the test points. You can connect to unpopulated connectors, just the pads directly on the circuit board. Sometimes you'll see option resistors. Um, so basically, when you're designing hardware, sometimes you'll design the hardware to have multiple different versions, um, so you know, the high-end version and the low-end version. Uh, and you'll have these little resistors on there that kind of select which version it is. And so if you move that, from one position to another, then all of a sudden you have access uh, to more features or whatever. But these are really good things to connect to um, as a hacker. You sometimes they'll want like a serial port through there, for example. If they want to disable the serial port, they might just take off the resistor and then it's not connected anymore. But you know, we know it's still there. Uh, and of course, directly to the important things as well. Um, so this this is a this is an example of something that we had to do where we had uh, good access to the flash memory, um, but we didn't have a flash reader. It was still in the mail. Uh, anyway, we were in a hurry, so I just soldered wires directly to the flash chip itself. The other end of these wires goes to a, uh, an old SD card that I tore apart, so I could stick it right into my laptop and it mounted, and I was able to dump all the memory that way. It was super, super easy. Uh, Interposer boards are a little more expensive, but basically what you do is you take the memory chip off. And so for a flash memory, um, like the above example, it's pretty straightforward to do it offline. If it's a RAM, what you would do is you put an interposer board between the circuit board and the memory chip. And so you can actually read the signals out of the, the memory while it's active. Um, so you can, you can monitor what's going on in memory in real time, which is kind of neat. Uh, and these chip clips are kind of fun for, they don't really work for a lot of modern high density components, but there's still a lot of old GIP packages or SOIC packages where you can just clip this right on top and every program a flash memory and you're done with flash memory. Um, and this one here is a another scanning electron microscope example where they've milled this kind of oval shaped hole through the top couple layers of, a, of the silicon through all the oxide layers. And you can see this glowing section underneath. Um, in the scanning electron microscope, what you'll find is the insulators appear dark and the metal appears bright. Uh, and that's just because it, uh, it glows with the electrons as they, as they bounce off. So you can kind of see the signal underneath. And then you use a probe station like this where you drop like a needle thin, um, or a hair thin needle directly in and touch on this, so you can actually read out the signals, uh, see what's going on on layers beneath the top layer on this little bit. Um, 
Neil, I've got this, um, this kind of a lot of money. There's at least one guy who has this kind of equipment in his garage down in California. Um, and we worked with him in the past. He's a really cool guy. Um, but yeah, most of the people that are doing this kind of stuff kind of grew up in the 80s and 90s under the whole uh, smart card wars. Um, so once you have access to the bus, um, what you can see, here's some examples of of some serial buses. So the top one is RS-232. It's very common for like a UR for a serial port. You'll see some kind of signal like that where you'll see the eight bits of time coming over in a serial fashion. Um, the, next, the next two are, are both X, Y, and C. Uh, and so in this one here, you have two signals. as a clock and a data. And so every time the clock happens, you'll see the data change. Um, it's both a read and a write. And then the bottom one is uh, SPI, which is another very common uh, serial interface. It's very similar to I squared C, uh, except it supports four different modes and it has a couple extra signals, which um, I don't know, you could read up the bottom if you're interested. But, um, and then, of course, you get all sorts of more complex things. You get like memory bus uh, CAN, which is a, a signal that's using automotive um, and you know, wider pair of all buses, you know, flash and RAM, and all sorts of things. Uh, JTAG I mentioned. Um, JTAG is essentially a uh, a test interface for manufacturing tests. Uh, later, it was added some debug capabilities. Um, almost all devices are going to have this sort of thing. Memory generally doesn't, but processors or any complex uh, system on chip. Um, and essentially, all all of this diagram here is what you'll see inside the actual device. And so, on the left here. This is, this is what you have access to, to a couple of pins that give you access to this test access port. And inside that, there'll be a multiplexer that gives you access to a bunch of other things. Um, for, for any like component that has security, quote unquote, they'll, they'll have JTAG disabled. And what they really need is they've got, they've got this disabled over here, just this piece. And all of the rest of this is enabled usually. Um, so the event and trace module and performance monitors are often used by software as well, so you can monitor the performance of your device and you can dump crash logs and things like that. So those disabling those kind of hinders in field debugging. So those are often left enabled. Um, boundary scan is almost always left enabled. I have never seen a device, despite asking the vendors for deadlines to disable this. Um, boundary scan is sort of the main thing that was JJ was invented for. It basically gives your external control uh, over all the pins on the chips. So you can uh, you know, see if they're high or low, or you can inject signals or whatever, and basically it's designed to see if this chip is connected to all the places on the board where it's supposed to be connected to, um, and you run these tests in manufacturing to make sure your device is built correctly. But what this does for an attacker is it gives them access to all the pins on the chip. So now I can, I can read and write all your external memories, I can control all your camera, your fingerprint sensor, whatever, whatever is you connected outside your chip, I've got access to that. Um, and so we've used this on like an iPhone to dump the RAM, for example. Uh, so you, know, you let it boot up, you get some emails in memory, and then we connect to this and we dump the contents and it was slow because we did it crudely, but you know, it took a couple of days, but we were able to get all the data out of the RAM. So that was kind of fun. Uh, and DFT is something you won't find documented as the design for test. So this is stuff that the silicon vendor has put, like debug features, they, they put it for their own manufacturing and debug use inside the chip and it won't be documented anywhere outside the vendor. Um, and you really have to ask about it and they'll deny it and then you know, talk to an engineer and be like, oh yeah, we do it all the time. Um, <laughs> but it's always there. They, they need to be able to debug these, these chips uh, and, and thrust manufacturing. And so that, that's always going to be in there. And that gives you like highly invasive access to the chip itself. Um, and so if you can either reverse engineer the chip and figure out how that works or find some internal documentation, then that's really, really bad as a, as a uh, attack vector. On the smart, on the smart chips, uh, like, uh, like PDB access, conditional access, all those sorts of things, that circuitry is often, so when you, when you build a, a chip, you, you start with a wafer and then you kind of pile out all your chips on there uh, and you test it at the wafer level and then you take a, a diamond saw and you cut it all up and then package it. So what they do is all this DFT circuitry is actually on that space in between that gets sawed off. So it's physically destroyed. Um, because they realize that these people were using this to attack their chips. Um, but somehow in the last 20 years, no one else has picked up on that. <laughs> <laughs> all, all of the uh, smart chip vendors. So some examples. Um, so the first generation iPhone, for example, uh, these signals here are the Atlas bus, and they run on the surface of the board, which means they're very, very accessible. Uh, so if you scratch off some of the green um, uh, solder mask and short back wire to this capacitor, 
then it actually reads from the wrong address in memory. It thinks there's nothing loaded, and it goes into this factory mode and like opens up like some SSH uh, shell or something like that. Um, and so they were able to jailbreak the first generation iPhone just by sticking it in essentially a paper clip on it, which is kind of neat. Um, and so, I mean, the obvious mitigation is to don't run your sensitive signals on the surface of the board. It should be like, you know, if you have a 12-layer board, put them on layer 6. Uh, Samsung and Xenos processor is one we looked at. Um, so this one, so Fuse, as I mentioned earlier, so th this allows you to kind of uh, permanently store bits of information like um, factory configuration, uh, there's some crypto keys in there, you know, whatever, whatever you like. So when I mentioned JTAG being disabled, that's usually disabled by Fuse. So you Fuse and JTAG is disabled, and there's no way to unprogram those. Now, on this particular processor, the on boot up, it would actually take those fuses, which is analog hardware, and load them into like a digital latch so that the software could read them. And that all happened before the software ever runs. And, but there was a, a number of clock cycles you have to wait uh, after boot up before the software runs. And that number of clock cycles was essentially reading in these fuses one, one chunk at a time. And because the fuse bank was on a separate power rail and a separate clock, you could essentially just like zero the clock, or zero the power on, on each clock, so that you basically selectively zero out fuses as they're read, regardless of what they're programmed to be, you could just have them read as zero. So you could you know, zero out the crypto keys, for example, or zero out the JJ disable. Um, so we found this sort of design stage, and it was fixed before the ship, but it was kind of important. Uh, this, hold on, FSM 7500, uh, this one was fixed before the ship as well. Um, but essentially, this is kind of a class of bug, which is very common, a partial code signing. So you have some blob, and there would be uh, a signature check on that blob of data or code, um, but some piece of it, or metadata, is not. So in this particular case, they had some config data which was designed to configure the RAM. So the, the, the operating system would be loaded into RAM and then run, or validated and then run. But you couldn't load it into RAM until the RAM was turned on. So there was a bit of metadata that would essentially allow you to read and write some registers, or well, write to some registers to configure the RAM. Uh, but there was no checks on the addresses. It was a bunch of address value pairs, you know, write this value to this register kind of thing. Um, and because it didn't have any checks on the actual address range, you could overwrite any memory, including the boot run stack. Uh, and then, you know, it's uh, so kind of fun. Oh, and this one here we found just by reading the specs. We were reading the specs and we're like, well, how does that work? And then they were like, well, I don't know, we'll go check. They came back and we're like, oh, cool. <laughs> um, flash write protect bypass. So most flash disks will have some sort of write protection, either on the whole flash or a part of the flash or, or whatever. And you know, so that's configurable. Um, on the two kinds of write protection, you'll have like a hard write protection where you can enable it and it'll be like a few in the flash and it's forever write protected. Most devices like MMC will have a soft write protect where you can you set a software command and, and say write protect this region and that write protect will get cleared on reboot and then you can re rewrite protect it. So in your boot code you would just rewrite it. Um, but you can bypass this on a lot of devices just by resetting the, the memory. Um, if they don't connect, if the designers haven't connected the, the reset line of the memory to the reset of the processor, you can reset the memory independent of the processor. So while the processor is running, you can just reset the flash as though it's just like a peripheral device uh, to reboot it, and, and, but the processor still runs. So you can essentially clear the, the flash right protect. Uh, and we see this one all the time, and I still see it on the client jobs. It's frustrating. It's a very easy thing to fix. Um, ASLR, so address uh, space layout randomization is sort of a, a software feature which basically puts things in random locations in memory uh, to, to help uh, mitigate a lot of software exploits. But this relies on some kind of entropy, you need some sort of randomness in the system. Uh, and at boot up, your system almost always has zero entropy. So if you can figure out how that works, then you can bypass the address randomization. So this is a, a neat example where you know, the software guys may have done everything right, but some hardware guy can come along and say, well, I can violate that assumption. I can you know, I get a little bit of information on boot up, and I can use that later to defeat the security, um, which is kind of a neat one. Uh, another Samsung one we found. So we used to do a lot of reviewing of, of processor specs before we select the, you know, the next generation of processors, um, where some of these came from uh, in the Samsung <coughs> Uh, so this, in this particular case, they had a random number generator hardware on the device, and it would start with zero entropy, and then slowly build entropy, um, and, and you know, slowly was kind of subjective. They didn't ever give us a clear answer whether it was milliseconds or minutes, but um, in any case, what they did is they measured all the entropy, and they ran it through a bunch of statistical analysis, and they're like, yes, it's good, 
But what they never did was connect, or connect the data from one device to another device. And what we found was that even though they all started diverging from each other, you know, in an entropy sense, they all started at the same point. So, you know, it took like you know, hours for them to diverge enough that you couldn't use data from one device to attack another. Kind of uh, MSP430, so this is uh, a researcher in the US, uh, Travis Goodsby. He, he was able to essentially glitch the, the voltage of the, the device on boot up. Um, essentially just, just essentially drop the voltage just ever so slightly, not enough to cause it to reboot, but just enough to cause it to misbehave. And in this case, uh, what we found was that a branch instruction was being misidentified. It would fall out of a loop where it wasn't supposed to, and then uh, the end result was a JTAG. Uh, it was about, you know, it was supposed to disable the JTAG uh, by, you know, read a fuse and then disable JTAG. In this case, it would read a fuse and then ignore that and then enable JTAG. Uh, so he's able to, like, take a device you know, off the shelf and then just, like, play with the voltage and enable JTAG and get access to whatever it is you need. Um, Furious Box is a fun one. So these, these guys make, uh, these, I think they're out of China, but basically what they make is a, an unlocking device. So you plug it into your cell phone and it'll remove all the subsidy locks. So if you buy a phone from Rogers, it, you know, you'll pay much less than the retail price, but you're locked into a three-year contract. Um, and the way they do that is they prevent you from putting a SIM card from another uh, carrier in there. So what these guys do is they make this unlocking tool. And this particular one was based uh, on our own factory tools. So they actually got hold of our factory tools and they packaged them up into this little box and they were using it directly. So I mean, there's an obvious copyright issue with them shipping our tools, but also you know, we, we relied at the time on obscurity of our tools. And they don't, nobody outside the factory will ever have these, therefore we don't have to worry about the security perspective <laughs> wrong. Um, and yeah, lessons were learned. Uh, but apparently those lessons weren't learning industry-wide because it, this box supports like 50 different vendors of phones um, still even now. Um, it doesn't support library anymore. Is that when our was invented? Part of yeah. Uh, this Ultra 66 thing, this is an old one, but a fun one. So I remember I mentioned option resistors. So this one here, there was like a $100 hard drive controller and then like a $900 RAID hard drive controller. They were exactly the same except for this one resistor. Um, someone figured that out, and you know, for like five cents or whatever, and all of a sudden you save yourself 900 bucks. Um, you put the resistor on, download the new firmware for the more expensive one, and, and you're good to go. And same thing with this, this little scope I think I mentioned this earlier. Um, you know, all, all the codes are in the memory. All the mem all the upgrades stuff is already in the software. You just have to enable it. So you just you download the memory, you find the codes, and there's scripts online to do this. It took me like five minutes. Cool. Save myself a couple thousand bucks. Uh, this is a good picture. Uh, this is an RF probe sitting on top of the chip, and so we're basically measuring the difference between uh, a computation that has a one and a computation that has a zero. Each one will have a subtly different signal, um, which you can measure that in the EM spectrum. Uh, yeah, straightforward. Uh, once you understand the math, you can do it. Is there millions of gates? There are. There are. So what you do is you run. You run your. Um, you test a bunch of times. In this case, we're doing like four or five thousand times, which is why you need an expensive school scope. It needs to have lots of memory, so you can capture like lots and lots of samples, and then you you average them together, and then all the noise kind of comes out of the wash and end up with a, a spike, and that's usually the, the one you want to report. Um, so, smart card interposer. So this is kind of a neat one. So I mentioned the uh, SIM card locking. Uh, so what these guys do, they actually sell these now, which is kind of neat. This is a tiny little uh, FPGA, and it sits in between the SIM card and the phone. And it fits like right inside the SIM drawer of your iPhone. And essentially what it's doing is a man in the middle attack between the phone and the SIM. It says, you know, you know what, what carrier am I on? And this little thing will lie about it and say, well, actually, you're on Rogers when you're on Bell or whatever. Uh, and you know, you're starting to see things like this making it into uh, ATM machines and all sorts of clever you know, skimming technology going on there. And because there's real money to be made, uh, you're incentivizing, or well, some of did, the, the criminals are incentivized to go and like develop this kind of technology. The original the original attack for this was published in a in a uh, academic report, and they used an FPGA board. It was like this big, it was clunky, and it was like, hey, it's great, it's very academic. And like two years later, this thing is on the market. You can buy these for like ten bucks. So, <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. So criminal the criminals are paying attention. <laughs> and that's it.
Any questions? Was there a time limit? I wasn't even watching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and did you drop the H? What do you think about Stuxnet? Stuxnet? That's a hard word. Uh, uh, so there's there's a lot of interesting uh, conspiracy theories about about how those sort of like government funded hacking things go and like bridging bear gap networks. There's as a, as a result of all these conspiracies, people have started doing some interesting academic research to say, well, you know, it, it might be possible, but how would we do it? And so they started, one guy, he was able to take his laptop and cause it to emit ultrasonic sounds by screaming with their VGA signals or something like that. You can't hear, but, and then he was able to pick that up on a microphone on another laptop, like two offices down. And so he was able to implement like a TCP connection. <laughs> like a little bit with TCP connection. But this, you know, this might be an air gap system, it's not on the same network as that other one. But now we can send data back and forth. So people have been like kind of developing all this like theoretical NSA technology, um, which is kind of neat to see. And um, you know, I mentioned that MMC memories, they have a, a microcontroller that can be hacked and as said has been done. And it was a similar kind of group of people, um, they basically said, Well, how would this USB stick work? You know, I could check this USB stick, I plug it in, I can see it's blank. But this little controller on there, if I can reprogram that, I can have it hide things for me. Uh, and then I can use that to inject malware into the host and things like that. And so people have done that as tools you can download them, you know, you play with this. Um, and people actually do this to make money. They'll take like a four gigabyte uh, memory stick and they'll change the controller and make it look like a 16 gigabyte one itself for four times as much money. And then you buy it, it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> so you buy like a really cheap USB stick, likely this is what's happening. Um, so you know, anytime there's money to be made, you'll I have one of those in my house. Yeah. I have a 128 gig SD card that's, I think, I think it's 512 meg. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but if you try to use it all, it doesn't work, right? No, it, it gets really slow. I mean, like, I didn't end up paying for it, this, obviously. Yeah. But, uh, I, I, I expected it was big when I bought it. I was just like, yeah, yeah it's real. Real. definitely. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> There's a website, I think it's called like NSA Playset or NSA Toolkit or something like that. I forgot to look it up. But basically, these guys are like making a list of all the things that came out, like the Snowden revelations, about like all the different technologies and things that they supposedly have. And they're trying to like invent them because you know, it's probably possible. Awesome. Let's see if we can do it. Yeah, it's a great hobby. Yeah. The latest Blackberry Android phone um, claims that they are the best Android, uh, the most secure Android phone. Uh, I understand the Linux kernel has been hardened, but do they have also hardware uh, security? I don't know. I left BlackBerry in 2011 long before that. So. Oh, okay. But, if, it's, uh, if it's in the marketing material, you have to assume that it's definitely false. <laughs> <laughs> Especially from a security point it's, it's probably true within a very narrow definition. <laughs> uh, they, they will have done some things that others haven't done, but they may not. I would, Making the claim that they're the most secure is pretty bold for anyone. You're talking about like decapping <laughs> chips and then like <coughs> and stuff. And what like what what are you looking for when you do that? Because at that point you're you're basically just tearing all the guts in. Like you're not gonna that's not necessarily something that you can do non invasively to some device that you encounter. What are you looking for when right. you're so in that case, getting into it? In that case, what you would, you would look for is to learn information. Uh, so you like you want to reverse engineer the chip, find out how it works. If there's some code, like a ROM, in the chip itself, uh, the fuse is a really good example because they'll load like uh, secret keys and things like that. If you can extract those pieces of information, um, then you can start reverse engineering the ROM, figure out the software in there works. There might be there might be a software backdoor, it might be a buffer overflow, there might be all sorts of things. Once you know that, then you can take that information and then exploit a non-destroyed device. Okay. Re regarding decapping, by the way, you can do this for like. Ten dollars with some like metric acid from the hardware store, um, and there's tons of videos online. Don't do it in your house because it stinks real bad. It's quite toxic. Um, but if you want to do it professionally, there's like a twenty thousand dollar machine. You put the chip in, press go, come back in twenty minutes, and it's done. Um, that's the one I sourced for, for my, my budget. They have yet to approve. <laughs> so much safer way to go. And then the last question, Matt. Was uh, you were also talking about how they fixed a couple of these problems before it shipped? Yeah. Is there some sort of like community that they send like dev builds of their hardware? Yeah. So, to? so in those, in those cases, it would be like uh, engineering samples or something. So we'd get uh, 
we would get like pre-release access to the documentation so we could start writing software or you know building prototypes and things like that. But it wasn't actually production hardware yet. Right. So they would fix it on the next they they always when they were making silicon they'll do like multiple versions, they'll find bugs and they'll fix it to the next one. And they'll try and queue up as many bugs as they can for the next fix. Um, and so when they're doing silicon, you know, eight to ten versions is not uncommon. Uh, especially like a complex thing like that. Yeah, exactly. And and, and and but throughout that process they're also working at the kinks in the manufacturing process. So the first ones, they might have a yield of like five percent, you know, isn't getting built enough, for example, because the beam comes out like on a comb. So they have to play with all those levels, and there's a couple of things they have to calibrate and whatnot. Um, but by the time they get to production, they're making millions and billions of them, then the yield has to be like massive. Right. As close to 100%, or you're not going to make money. And is, is hardware hacking one of the things that they're actually trying to, to get out in that phase? Like, are they trying to send it to people who they know no, to this kind of thing? Generally, I'm going to say no. <laughs> uh, so if you send it out to your your, your OEM to your customers and they're designing things, they might find bugs and report them and fix them. So that's that's what happens in these examples. Right. Generally when they're making chips, they're not sending out unless it's a secure component, like a right. specifically designed security device, they're not really gonna send it to the security community to analyze. A lot of companies when they're designing things, and this is the same with software, they may hire uh, an external consultancy and that's and that's what we do uh, at NCC Group is you know, we'll come in and we'll review your designs, we'll, we'll do a test on your product, you know, and we'll write a report and show you all the bugs we found and give you a bunch of recommendations on how to fix them. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're designing some kind of security sense of product or you just you know, want to have a better security posture, then you know, there's like dozens and dozens of consultancies out there that do this kind of thing. And you do, and they, you, they bring you in at, at the design phase? It, it, they get better value for money if they do. Right. Most often, they bring us in at the end because one of their <laughs> clients said, we're not going to buy this unless you have some kind of audit report. And then we come in and it's too late. And we're like, well, here's your audit report, but it's not very good. Because <laughs> you didn't do all of the, the things right. But if, you, I mean, if we get hired at the design phase, then we can like, work in lockstep with your designers and figure out how to, how to make it good from the ground up. So the hardware is really hard to fix after the fact. Yeah. And it's not like you just release a software update. Right? I would say it's harder. <laughs> yeah, one more on this exact point. Uh, you mentioned uh, at the beginning, I think, that you estimated like 15 years of difference between uh, hardware maturity on the screen. Now. How do you measure across such diverse? Uh, it's an estimate based on my gut feeling and experience. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little squiggle in front of 15. I saw a squiggle. I apologize if I quote the squiggle. No, I just like, you squiggle. see. Like things that like Microsoft was being hacked back in the '90s, and you know, and they they learned a lot from that. They implemented tons and tons of software mitigations. In the hardware side, that same level of kind of public scrutiny hasn't happened for a long time. Um, so yeah, you just like the smart card wars. Yeah, but that was kind of very niche market. Um, th I mean, there's a ton of information that you're like, oh, I'm gonna do this novel thing, and you look in the literature, and you're like, well, actually, they discovered this in the '80s, and why didn't anyone know this? Why, why is nobody reading those papers? Why is nobody implementing all these hardware security measures? And, and the reason it comes out of cost or you're for, you know. It's that you don't have to run the fair thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so is Intel any different? Or is it? Intel, Intel is a big company. They do everything internally. Um, they're kind of opaque. It's hard to, hard to tell. It's hard to tell. But one thing with Intel is they are saddled with tons and tons of legacy. So they don't. It, to my knowledge, they've never really started fresh and designed security from the ground up. They've always tried to bolt it on as, as layers. And so you might have a really secure system, but the thing that it's built on is 15 years old, and no one's touched it in 15 years, and it's probably not secure. So it's, it's hard to say. And it, they're, because they're so opaque, it's really hard to get information out of them. They tend to compartmentalize um, a lot of things. We had, uh, we had used one, well, a bunch of devices from Marvell. Whether it used to be Intel, they were sold to Marvell. Um, and we were asking questions like, you know, if we send advice back for failure analysis, how do you debug that? Because we've disabled JTAG, so you shouldn't be able to. And there are a lot of other process for that. No one asked the question. But we had to get three different engineers in the room. No one knew the whole piece of the puzzle. But once we got them all together, they were like, we realized, okay, they have a back door. This guy did this piece of the puzzle. That guy did that piece of the puzzle. They didn't know what it was for. And once they put them together, like, holy shit, there's a back door on this thing. <laughs> Whereas, you know, like Freescale, for example, we, we asked the same question, and they're like, oh, well, we just we put it on a fib and we reconnect it. I'm like, okay, that's a good answer. And I think that's, that's the level of expense. Like, it's going to cost you like $1,000 to diagnose this problem. But as an attacker, 
that's a thousand dollars per device. Whereas if there's a back door in there, it's a thousand dollars for the first device, it's zero for the next one, and the next one, and the next one, which is a really kind of bad design practice. I don't know if they still do that. I mean, once we found a problem, we kind of fixed it. 